Hi, my name is Jim. I am one of the core developers on the Facebook team, uh, specifically React. And what I'm gonna talk about is sort of how we got to where we are in React and the design decisions, sort of the core mentalities that we use to uh, figure out what we want to do and how we're building uh, the next versions. So to start off, um, actually how many of you have used React before? Okay, so it looks like about half of you. Uh, it's awesome. What is React? Can someone tell me what React is? Yeah. Uh, it's, like, it's like web components, but it works in old versions of Internet Explorer. Yes, it's like web components that work in old versions of Internet Explorer. <laughs> what else? It's like a way of separating your state from your view logic. Very good. So separation of state and view logic. Any other ideas? Yep. Purely functional model to go from state to uh, the DOM that you want to render, and then using uh, DOM dipping to recover the efficiency that you might have. Very cool. So stateless transformations, um, sort of functional transformations from state into DOM, and then making that fast. Um, that's absolutely correct. Some of the other things I've seen, uh, JavaScript library for building user interfaces is very true. The V and MVC, so React doesn't handle uh, the whole process, it doesn't handle your data fetching or anything else, just the view. Um, and it's a front end library that runs in the browsers and renders user defined components. So very much like web components, that's exactly right. Um, what I'm going to say is that React is actually a bridge between a declarative and an imperative API. This is actually how we think of it. Um, the fact that we use components for modularization and the fact that we are a functional transformation are both very interesting and very important. But the way we see it is that we have two differing views of the world. We have a declarative view that says what things are and we have an imperative view that says how to do things. And what React really is, is a transformation between those two. And that's why we can see the same idea, the same concept, and we can actually use the core framework across so many different platforms. Um, you know, Netflix is starting to build things on top of React. We have React Art, we have uh, React for SVG, we have React for the DOM, we have React Native. Uh, we have all of these different systems building on top of this core idea, and it's all because what we're actually doing is bridging the declarative and imperative API. Let me show you what I mean by that, what that looks like. Uh, so, React components is basic building blocks uh, for developing your application, equivalent to a web component, as you mentioned, and um, basically re reuse these modules and rebuild modules across these apps. Uh, one of the interesting things is that we can reuse components across different platforms. You can write a component in uh, renders to HTML um, as the bottom layer, and components in between can be using similar uh, view logic, so you can actually render uh, what was an HTML view directly in React Native, just replace links with uh, the equivalent for a React Native for iOS or Android, uh, replace the underpinnings of your components, but the core components can be reused uh, because we're not assuming anything about the architecture. Um, so back up a little bit to, to what React is, uh, for specifically, Suppose a designer gives you these three items. They say, we want to display notifications. Uh, if there are no notifications, we want to display a bell. If we have eight notifications, we want to display a bell with a badge on it, with the number eight. And if they have more than 99 notifications, we want the badge to say 99 plus, and we want to put a fire behind the uh, bell. What this looks like in an imperative API is when you want to transition between states, say between the bell and the bell with the badge, uh, you say add badge and you say set the badge to 8. Similarly, when we want to transition to this state, we'd say add badge, add fire, set badge value to 99 plus. Uh, and you can imagine that as we add states here and need to transition between the states, we actually need to do effectively n squared work, n squared pieces of code that we have to write because we have to handle any transition from any state to any other state. If we look at what the code for that would look like, we see we say count is greater than 99. If it has fire, or if it does not have fire rather, then we add fire. Else, if it has fire, 
then we remove the fire because count is not greater than 99, and so there shouldn't be a fire there. If count is equal to zero, then it, and it has a badge, we want to remove the badge, else uh, we don't want to do anything there. Um, and then if it has a badge, if it does not have a badge, we want to add a badge, the te text, we set some string, and then we set the badge string. Um, this is an example just with three states. It's very difficult to reason about what's going on here. The React view of a declarative model, what we want to expose, is that if the text is greater than 99, or then we're going to set 99 plus, else we're going to find a string, and then we literally just say, this is the state of the world. And what we're going to do is we're going to rely on React to translate our declarative, this is the state of the world, to actually modify and make it so. So what React is doing, as I said, a declarative uh, bridge between declarative and imperative APIs, um, it's taking how we, uh, how, instead of updating how we want to update, or specifying how we want to update the DOM, we specify the desired results, and React makes it happen. So React is effectively a function that takes in a description of the world as it should be and changes it to how it, uh, and sets the real world to how it should, or to what the desired world is. Um, I want a function like that. So why do we do this? The key to re doing this is controlling complexity. Uh, Brian Cranan said that controlling complexity is the essence of computer programming. And that's actually what we're trying to do here. The virtual DOM uh, that sort of powers React and the reason that it's fast um, is an implementation detail. It's not the reason that React is cool. It just allows React to be this bridge in an efficient way. What are some other complex things that we want to avoid in React? One is we have this observation that complexity is oftentimes strongly correlated with data mutation. So relation, this relationship does appear to be causal. The basic idea is that uh, when we're mutating data, it is very difficult to understand that code oftentimes. Uh, this was the premise for building a declarative to imperative uh, bridge is that the fact that we can't manage all of these individual mutations on the fly, we want the framework to manage these mutations and we want to just think about what is actually visible. This actually inspires a lot of the uh, current deprecations that we're making. So for example, when you create a new element in React, uh, it used to be that you could go ahead and reset the properties on that element. So you could literally modify the physical element. And we'd see people storing all sorts of weird stuff inside of their React elements uh, that we never intended. But more importantly, it made the code very, very difficult to reason about. And so we're deprecating that. Um, similarly for set props API, we're deprecating it uh, that's different from mutating the props on the elements. This is setting props on a component. Um, deprecating that again, because data mutation is extraordinarily difficult. And by avoiding these data mutations, by avoiding the imperative API that's implied by them, what you're actually doing is you're allowing people to fall into the pit of success. So you're saying data mutation is hard, so we're going to avoid data mutation. We're going to make your, or have you write simpler code by making it more difficult for you to do data mutation, more difficult for you to use an imperative API, and thereby making your overall app much more manageable and much easier to work with. Uh, so yes, it's a huge part of our past and, and of sort of as we're moving forward with React, uh, you'll continue to see this trend of eliminating anywhere where we have data mutation. Um, so that, that's up there. Uh, separation of concerns. So established be best practices have been to separate your JavaScript, your HTML, and your CSS. Um, how many of you separate your JavaScript, HTML, and CSS? You have like different folders, for example. So interestingly, that's the other half of you guys. Um, and what I would argue is that separating the concerns here, separating JavaScript, HTML, and CSS is the wrong thing to do. And the reason for this is that these are technologies, they're not concerns. So as part of making a modular system, as part of developing a system where everything 
uh, can be used independently of each other and can be moved from platform to platform or at least from page to page, product to product, where you can share your code base across the company. Separating these three things makes no sense. JavaScript is how you decide what you're going to render on the page. Um, and separating that from the HTML, which is what you're rendering, is nonsensical because it means that when you want to change your HTML, you have to change your HTML and you have to change the JavaScript that touches that HTML. Similarly with CSS and HTML, if you change your HTML, you change the structure, you add some new tags, you're almost certainly going to have to change the CSS associated with those. There's no reason to separate them. So an individual component should be able to render everything. It, knows, it needs to know what the markup is that it wants to render. It needs to know how to modify that markup, the JavaScript. It needs to know how to style that information, the CSS. And if you separate them, then now you have to move several different pieces when you want to move a single component instead of just that component. So I, I would say uh, one of the overarching themes here is build things that are composable and modular, but package modules together. The sensible thing to move is what should be packaged together, not packaging based on technologies. Uh, let's see, so achieving simplicity, we want to keep APIs as simple as possible. This is sort of self-evident. Um, what this means is that we really aggressively prune off APIs that we don't like. So I would actually suggest that you take a look at, um, not to pick on Angular too much, but Angular is a large framework. Um, look at the APIs of Angular and then look at the APIs of React. Uh, there are probably a hundred different functions in the Angular library. Um, in React, there are roughly a dozen, maybe less. Um, and of those, half of them you're not going to use that often. So keep APIs extraordinarily simple. Um, it's impossible to predict all future use cases. This is one of the key motivating themes of React, is that we don't know what the industry is going to want to do. We have amazing engineers all over the world who are developing all of these new technologies and new ideas that we actually haven't thought of. We built React and we don't know all the ways that it can be used. And so what we want to do is provide the simplest, lowest level APIs where each individual operation is fully flexible. We're not making assumptions about what it does, but it allows you to perform a specific task. So implementing the view, bridging between a declarative and imperative API uh, without over constraining the situation, thereby allowing other people to do interesting research and build on top of this. Uh, so that's one of the powerful things for keeping uh, things simple is you offer a few low-level APIs rather than a lot of sort of magical APIs. Minimize assumptions to maximize generalizability. So one of the things that's really interesting is React was built specifically for the purposes of running in a web browser in like a JavaScript context without any, uh, any consideration of other targets. And one of the things that we started doing is we saw, oh, React is extraordinarily successful on web. Um, what else can it be used for? React Art came of this. Uh, we have all these other companies, though, that are building their own targets. It's actually really common to see people trying to apply React to completely new areas that we had never applied it to. Um, this is one of those generalizability things that we really like. This was almost accidental. It was accidental, actually. And now we're seeing things being built for phones. We're seeing things being built for uh, you know, set-top boxes. We're seeing things being built for art. We're seeing things being built for all sorts of industries that uh, didn't previously exist. And it's this fact that we can keep things generalizable. Um, we're going to continue to see this. This was actually one of the big things in 014, which is the newest release coming out. Um, it's all centered around making everything more generalizable, making it so you can implement your own renderers, making it so that you can implement uh, sort of any given component of React, and therefore we're not making assumptions about what platform you're running on or what you're building. Uh, you can choose to replace entire modules of React. 
Uh, I went through that real fast. I meant to have you guys ask questions and things. Do you guys have any questions or feedback or thoughts or what do you? Yes. So it all sounds awesome. What would you say your biggest sort of issue is? What's the biggest challenge with React? Um, the biggest challenge currently pending or biggest? Yeah. So the biggest thing that we're tackling right now is if you have a piece of data, some sort of a um, subscription type system. So you have the server sends an update to the client, for example, or the client is updating some data or listening for some data. How do you notify the client or the individual components that this data has changed? Uh, so one of the patterns that we're exploring is observables. So this idea that a component can specify things that it needs to observe, and when one of those observ observables has a new value, it will notify the components. Um, an alternative model is having all of the uh, data stores that store this data uh, emit every time that you do a read to them and that you do a write and figure out from that sort of what components are listening to, what individual components are relying on, and then when that data changes, updating the components. So right now it's getting data from someone who has the data and manages the data and knows what it is to the appropriate components that need to render that data. Yeah, so the rendering aspect of it, basically mutating what the declarative API that a user has specified and turning that into imperative commands, um, we have that down pretty well. And that's, that's one of the more stable areas of the call. Yes? Yeah, I had a question. Uh, if you lump all the CSS and everything in one uh, bundle like that, how do you handle uh, vendor prefixes? So, Ben, vendor prefixes currently are not well handled. Um, one of the things that you can do is specify a vendor prefix inside of the style object. So you specify, for example, all the vendor prefixes or the vendor prefixes based on browser detection. Um, but what you're effectively doing is you're, you have all the information that a component needs inside of that component. So you don't have to load an external CSS style sheet, is mainly what I'm trying to say. Uh, anything that you could do in an external style sheet, you should ideally be able to do inside of the component itself. Um, just apply the, the styles at the component level instead of at an external style sheet level. So, that means you like kick SAS and less to the curve, or I mean, what do you, you can't use those, right? Um, I mean, how would you use so, SAS and less and it? Sure. So, Basically, SAS and less, there are many sort of key things that they introduce, one of which is like variables. Um, all of these things can be modeled in JavaScript. There's really no reason why you have to model that information inside of a external domain specific language. You can model it in JavaScript, you can write everything that you have as sort of code that you execute code that you already know how to write and perform the same operations. So how do you solve the module dependence? So maybe module A, uh, module B in the two dependent module, uh, module, module A. So how do we solve this problem? Yeah, so that's, so if we punt on that problem, we say that's the responsibility of your package manager. So something like Webpack um, can organize your dependencies for you and manage that. Um, but that's, like what we're trying to do is we want to integrate well and fit well with any framework and any architecture, any system that you're building. Um, so we don't want to specify how you do module dependencies. Um, but that actually brings us to one of the other sort of difficult points is like, how do you bootload components lazily if you want to lazy render things? Uh, we don't have a good solution for that yet, but we're working on it. So my understanding is that for example, I mean, to reduce, to improve the performance, so maybe in the, um, in, in production time, so we are trying to compile our um, different modules together. So do you have any recommend, you know, which tool we, we, yeah, we are using to do the like, compile, compress, and minimize? Um, again, we're agnostic. We, we don't care which tool you use. There are several tools out there like Webpack. Um, Webpack is probably a pretty popular one currently. 